Uh, I just checked. Uh, is it better now? No. Uh, now is it better? Yes. Okay. Now can you guys hear me without an echo? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, start. Uh, welcome everyone to the workshop Wednesday. Uh, we are glad to have you all here with us to talk about uh, building an inclusive and accessible environment in academia. Uh, before we start today's conversation with our panelists, I want to briefly uh, introduce the people and the work behind this workshop and the entire Wednesday workshop series, as well as provide you the general flow of today's event. Uh, so today's workshop has been organized by GSA's uh, Career Development Subcommittee in collaboration with <clears throat> the Accessibility and Disability Advocacy uh, Group. The co-hosts, uh, Oindrila and Madhu, uh, and I have put together the blueprint of the event, but every member of the committee showcased here has been instrumental to make this event happen. A special thanks to Jessica, the Acting Director of Engagement for the Early Career Leadership Program for providing us with the essential technical in coordination uh, to our planning. Uh, also, this event, today's workshop has been put together with the help from Accessibility and Dis Disability Advocacy Group at the Early Career Leadership Program at GSA. And I would particularly like to mention the contribution and, and help of uh, Adelita Mendoza. Um, the aim of today's workshop is to learn about the resources available to people with disabilities in academia and resources available for people trying to create inclusive and access accessible uh, spaces. Uh, last but not the least, I want to share a few notes and ground rules with everyone in the audience today. Uh, please note that all views and opinions shared in today's workshop are those of the panelists themselves and, are, and not of the organizations that they represent or have worked for. In addition, any mention of a company by a panelist is not an endorsement for that given company or brand unless specifically stated. This workshop is a safe space, so we welcome you to ask honest questions to our panelists by dropping them in the chat box to everyone. However, if you are being distress, disrespectful in this space, we will ask you to leave the workshop. So please be mindful of others. Uh, members of, the, of our committee will be collecting questions from the chat box. And if they are not addressed in today's discussion, uh, please do not worry. We will make sure to, to provide answers after the workshop in the form of career resources. Also, you do not need to write down notes or resources. All the resources mentioned will be collected and compiled by our team and will be sent to all participants after the workshop. And just one last note, uh, in case you want um, live captioning, on the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you should see a live on Otter AI link. If you click that link, uh, you can just go to view stream on Otter AI and you can get a live transcript of the chat um, that is as it is happening. Okay, so let's begin today's discussion by first allowing our panelists to briefly introduce themselves uh, by telling us uh, what do they do. Uh, 
So we can start with uh, Dr. Vance Martin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vance Martin. I am the Executive Policy Advisor for Accessibility for the University of Illinois System. Uh, I've been in this position for about a year. I started in accessibility in 2007 as a grad student. Um, I was an instructional designer and uh, I helped create or make our program entirely compliant at the time. So that was under WCAG 1. Uh, and then kind of that led towards my career path. Um, I had several postdocs and accessibility became a part of those. Um, my first faculty position uh, was as a professor of instructional design. Uh, accessibility was a key part. And then in 2017, I, I took over at University of Illinois Springfield as the uh, head of accessibility for that campus before moving to the system, which uh, oversees three campuses, Champaign, Springfield, and Chicago. Ankit, you're muted. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I just oh, thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, and I was saying that uh, next we can move on to Alyssa. Hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa Paparella. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white female. I have brown hair and I'm wearing a ponytail. I have a black shirt on that has a floral print. I am currently a second year PhD student at Baylor College of Medicine. I was a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College in 2019. After that, I went on to do a post baccalaureate program called PrEP through the NIH at the University of California, Davis. And then I led my way to Baylor. Um, I also organize and run a page on Twitter called Disabled in STEM. So I do a lot of disability advocacy work and I'm really excited to have this conversation with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, and last, uh, if you could have Dr. Stephen Kluza introduce uh, himself. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Kluza. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am a white male. Uh, my hair is actually longer than my professional heads up because of COVID. Uh, but you know, longest hair, uh, I have kind of a plaid so in my background, I'm kind of sewing the Drosophila larval salivary gland. So exciting time. All right, uh, so essentially, um, uh, I am a deaf uh, professor. So when I was in undergrad, I was partial um, hearing loss and I uh, got my uh, undergraduate degree in Florida State University, then went back to Florida State University for my PhD. And during grad school, I lost the rest of my hearing at the time and um, had to spend some of that time to undergo cochlear implantation uh, to regain some of my hearing. So that took a long process, uh, but I got my PhD and then I did a postdoc at University of Chapel Hill, um, North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, where I worked uh, for a few years on free fly epigenetics. Then I moved to Atlanta uh, to be with my then girlfriend, now wife, and uh, I look into uh, doing teaching uh, at small colleges and so forth. So I've done that for a few years before I finally wound up at my present location, Clay State University in Moore, Georgia. So it was, I am assistant professor of biology uh, for about a little over a year now. So and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, and very happy to have you here on the panel, Dr. Kluza. Um, all right, so uh, we can begin our discussion. Uh, so the first question is, that we have is for Alisa and Dr. Kluza, and the question is, um, how has your experience been navigating through academia with a disability, and did or do you face any challenges and how do you try and overcome them? I can start with that question. So as somebody with a disability, I've definitely had a very difficult challenge trying to get into graduate school in science in general. 
I grew up in a small community in New Jersey where we didn't really have a great education system. So I wasn't really introduced into science until really I came into my undergraduate at Sarah Lawrence College. So I was way behind everyone else who was in my genetics course and everybody knew so much more. I was like, what's an allele? I had no idea what was happening. But the reason I really got into science was because my mentors at Sarah Lawrence really invested in me. They took the time to help me learn stuff from a foundational perspective, and then also the lab skills that came with it. I have difficulty with fine motor skills, so I had to try and figure out how do I work a microscope? How do I use all of these equipments and tools I've never even heard of before? So I was really lucky because I had mentorship along the way, but even then they weren't a disabled person and they didn't really know what obstacles I would face along the way and how I would get into graduate school. So with that in mind, I kind of sought out research opportunities specifically for disabled individuals because otherwise I was getting told I was a liability to be in the lab. So I did a, a research experience for undergraduates, so REU offered through the National Science Foundation at the University of Delaware. I did this before my senior year and it's specifically for eight to 10 students that are disabled to work in research labs and get experience. So that really led me to my first research experience. And I was like, wow, this is something I really like and I want to do. So after that, then I went back for my senior year and I knew I couldn't go straight to graduate school because it was like, I knew I still needed an experience and I wanted to find my own strengths in the lab itself. So I applied for prep programs through the NIH. So this is for underrepresented minorities, including specifically disabled people. But even during the application process, many of the administrators of the programs were like, how do you qualify? And I was like, oh, because of my disability. And they were like, we're not sure we could help you or this is gonna be a good fit program wise for you. So I was fortunate that University of California Davis took the risk on me and they're like, come on out and we'll see like what you could do and learn, see what you are able to do. And I learned a lot throughout my year. My year was cut short because of COVID but I was fortunate enough that throughout the year, I was able to get into Baylor where I'm at currently. So since being in graduate school, it's definitely been an issue trying to navigate because I faced a lot of ableism in my rotations and trying to find the right lab. Even now, like I think the biggest challenge is I always have to be able to advocate for myself, which is an exhausting process in itself, but having to have that voice and try and connect with others so I'm part of and president of a disability group I founded at Baylor. So I'm able to connect with other students. We could come together and say, hey, we're having these issues at the disability center. How can we make this easier for everyone? So for my path specifically, the challenges have been trying to advocate for myself. And I've been trying to navigate that by finding allies, whether the disabled themselves or someone who's willing to help and learn about the experience of being disabled. Thanks. All Thank right. You so, much. so um, in terms of my experience, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, from the time I was really born until grad school, I had partial hearing loss. So when I went through undergrad, um, I didn't really um, utilize any disability services at that time. Uh, you know, I did have some conversations with them going to a disability uh, leadership conference and so forth. Uh, but it's been very limited in that at that point because one of the things I do want to kind of point out is at the time, partial hearing loss, I still had about 65% hearing. And I was very much used to um, really hyper focusing on people's um, faces, lip and hearing them and lip reading together. So uh, I was always able to. Uh, get by and even thrive from time to time during that. So I didn't really utilize any services, so to speak. So when I was in the middle of undergrad school, I mean graduate school, uh, I lost the rest of my hearing because it turned out to be a previously undiagnosed uh, inner ear defect. So, you know, it basically, you know, I had tinnitus and everything and all of a sudden I could not communicate with people. And uh, even then, I didn't really have much in the knowledge of what kinds of things were available for me. Um, and I think, if, you know, at some point, we probably will touch upon the conversation, the lack of services for grad students and beyond, right? 
uh, whatever limited services they do have for disabled students tend, tend to be at the undergraduate level. But I was very lucky uh, that uh, the people that I taught for and worked with at Florida State University were very understanding. So they allowed me to um, just be there to the best of my ability. Um, I used a dry erase board to ask questions and, and answer. So I even did that for the lab I was teaching because I had to do that to get enough money to live, right? Uh, so, uh, but that took a long time uh, to get the implementation, the implantation of the cochlear. We did one at a time. And we also had to do the rehabilitation aspect. The first time you get implanted, you don't understand anything. Your brain doesn't. Your brain has to relearn how to get that information. So that uh, extended my grad school year from, you know, what you want to do, you want to be out by the fifth year. I was seven and a half, right? So it took that long. It really got in the way of a lot of experiments, uh, efficiency, and so forth. Um, so, you know, and I didn't have as many papers as I would like because as a result of this, right? Uh, so even with that, I, you know, was able to get a postdoc position. Uh, one of the things I do want to kind of mention in terms of what I've experienced, um, applying for funding for the, as a postdoc and for a lot of uh, NIH uh, grants now, um, I don't know if they still do it anymore, but, um, at the time, they used to have this section where you could say you could talk about mitigating circumstances um, that could account for why you didn't have this type of publication record and so forth. So, you know, I, in good faith, put everything in there. Then, of course, my grant comes back non, not discussed and it basically says, well, you know, the publication record is so far, and unless you do a lot of this postdoc, then um, you're not going to make it in academia, and no mention whatsoever of the mitigating circumstances, right? So um, that was kind of deflating. Um, and I, I speak about these experiences because I do want to highlight here that uh, I am disabled, I am deaf, but I also have the privilege of being a white male um, in this in this field, right? So. In the experiences I have really received here, I do not wish on anyone else. And again, I'm not trying to compare like apples to oranges, right? Because everyone has their own issue and their own, you know, pain and so forth. But I know that there, there have been a lot of other people who have gone through a lot more than I have, right? So um, kind of cut, cut to the present day where I'm assistant professor of biology. Uh, one of my big interests is expanding the possibilities of undergraduate research while making them as accessible as possible when you build them. Universal design for uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, documents and so forth. Um, I, I think it's, you know, at some point I'll talk about a little bit more about some of the things I've been doing. But I've really taken on a lot of this advocacy as part of uh, what I hope to be kind of like the legacy of my professorship. Uh, because um, like Alyssa says, I've been able to advocate for myself as well. But there's so many people who are in compromised situations who can't advocate for themselves without uh, being retaliated against. And so, it's, you know, I, I feel like it's a moral obligation for me to help speak. Um, not for them to help speak with them, to help give them visibility and representation. So thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your experiences. Um, okay, so the next question that we have is for Dr. Martin, uh, but we would also like to hear what Alisa and Dr. Cluza think about it. So the question is, what are the greatest barriers to accessibility in academia according to you and since you uh, you have been uh, you are and you have been in, in in positions where you 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 had the chance to influence policies uh, what changes uh, were you able to implement at at the various institutions at, that you have been at and how do you think they benefited students with disability sure <clears throat> 
so uh, I would I would echo what what Stephen said there. Uh, being a cis white male uh, gives me a lot of access, and so I try to take that with uh, you know all of the responsibility that I can, um, which also allows me to be in some back rooms where certain things get said, and um, I would say that. There are three large barriers when it comes to disability and accessibility in academia, and they are resistance, lack of knowledge, and lack of expertise. Um, so, to to just give a, a brief some brief you know explanations there. So, resistance is typically um, I, I've worked a lot with faculty, and I do a lot of presentations on you know how do we make stuff accessible and how do we do this, um, and Typically, you will hear things such as, uh, well, you know, I've been teaching for 20 years and I've never had a student with a disability. <clears throat> and so, you know, you have to say, oh, that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, did you know that the CDC, depending upon which study we look at, says that between 19 and 33% of the population has some form of disability. So unless you're, you know, in humanities and have never taken the stats classes, statistics would, you know, suggest that uh, you have had someone in the past. Uh, they may have not felt comfortable coming to you uh, because of that, but you have. And so, you know, for those students and all of your other students, we need to do this. And then of course, you know, that's, that's the, uh, I guess the, the carrot of sorts. And then of course there is the stick where I then get to say, at least in Illinois, uh, four federal and one state law that covers this. So we have to do this. Um, so there's, there's a lot of resistance. Um, sometimes it's easier to couch it in ways to say things such as, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of articles and typically every journal has a different uh, format for how I'm supposed to cite my articles. Uh, everyone's willing to do that for APA or Chicago or whatever. Um, you know, let's just do the same format and make stuff accessible. Um, lack of knowledge. I think that that's, it's really just, you know, um, it's not willful. It really is, you know, oh, I didn't know this, you know, Oh, typically it's like with PDFs. Uh, somebody will say, well, you know, I, I give all my students PDFs. Isn't that okay? And you're like, well, no, <laughs> PDFs aren't natively accessible. They can be, but it requires work and time. Um, so then they go, but, you know, I have 43 PDFs that I use in my class each semester. Well, we're going to have to do some work on those. Um, and then it comes down to, I, I mean, I think we're in a point where this is changing but it's it's the expertise to get people who can help make stuff accessible and help be those advocates uh, so getting to you know what have i done <clears throat> when i was at springfield you know i heard the faculty would say well i don't know how to do this i can't do this i have so much stuff there's so much backlog what are we going to do or what are you going to do um so i worked with our uh, our CFO and I got funding to uh, hire student workers. And so I had a team, I started with a team of four and I collected a lot of data and we did a lot of work and it was successful the first semester. So it continued the second semester. Uh, actually, when I left that position to come to the system level, uh, one of my initial student workers who graduated has taken over my old position. Um, and she now has a team of nine student workers uh, doing the work there. And I'm going to guess at this point that about 25% of all uh, websites, files used by staff, and also teaching materials for the whole campus have been made accessible and had at least one go through. Uh, so, I mean, but it takes time. And it's, I mean, it's a process. And Every day, it's, it's re-educating and having the same conversations over and over and over. One thing Thanks I'd so like much. to bring up is that disability yeah. is very diverse. So when we talk about disability, it's a huge spectrum. So you have people who have invisible disabilities, which you may look at them and you may not think they're disabled, or you have people who are visibly disabled, say they use a mobility aid, such as a cane or a wheelchair. 
I think one of the issues comes down in academia in general is often if you look at somebody and you're like, I don't see anything, people are resistant to believe that there is a disability. So I recently started using a cane within the last year, and now people are so much more understanding when I need accommodations or something because they visibly have a cue and it makes sense to them. But prior to that, there was definitely a lot more resistance. So I think even in terms of like when it comes to professors teaching, they're like, well, I don't see anybody in a wheelchair, but they don't understand students may have learning disabilities and that still requires accommodations and equal access within the classroom. So understanding that disability is a very broad spectrum, I definitely think is something, message that we're all trying to get out and have an impact on. In terms of how I see everything's changing and the navigations, I find Twitter being a really big resource for people to start conversations about being disabled and what that actually means. Through my Twitter page, actually, I was invited to the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy to have a conversation about being disabled in STEM and what does that mean, what resources are missing. So I really do think that even social media can have a big impact on these conversations and challenging people to think outside of the box. And like you, like Van said, there are people that are like, oh, I never had a disabled student. But if you're seeing these conversations online and they tell them, hey, maybe I should turn on closed captioning. Maybe I should make my PDFs more accessible. So I think that the advocacy in social media is also representing a change in terms of how we're about going about the future and disability rights. Yep. So uh, I just want to kind of mention uh, one thing just to uh, add on to what Vance and Alyssa said. So um, I think Vance can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a key part of the resistance for accessibility is what Alyssa said, that there's a broad spectrum of disability, each with their own kinds of uh, native solutions that's needed to accommodate them, right? So it's not an easy one-step answer. Like we have diversity initiative to bring in more non-white people into the department and that should solve the problem, right? So it's like, okay, we need to um, make our presentation colorblind friendly, um, accessible for dyslexic people. Uh, also uh, the color scheme, you know, especially for people with migraine because there are some people with severe migraine that's actually disability itself, right? Um, make it compatible with screen readers, right? So that those things kind of start piling up. And I think that's a huge part of some of the resistance to this, right? Because, and again, um, we, we, know, we know the situation with faculty. I, I know that we always tend to be maxed out. But I do say that, you know, that is a systemic problem. It's not something we should pass on down to the students that are merely trying to be here to learn because they really want to be in STEM. They want to be a scientist, right? It is not an easy discipline. All they're asking for is an even footing so that they can actually have a chance, right? So, you know, those are systemic issues um, that, you know, kind of get passed down to the student and put the onus on the student to solve that problem where uh, it, that's not correct, right? Uh, as faculty and, you know, academic, we need to be proactive in dismantling some of those academic barriers. Thank you so much for those uh, thoughtful and revealing answers. Um, the next question that we have is again for Alyssa and Stephen. And the question is, what do you get asked the most frequently about accessibility or disability in your position or in your experience? My answer is kind of sad, but mine is, but if you're the only person who's disabled, why should we do these things? So if I'm requesting access, say, closed captioning. They're like, but if you're the only one doing it, why should we put in the extra work in order to do it just for you? So mine's definitely a little bit of a sad note, but it definitely needs to spark conversations of this needs to change is yes, it may be needed for one person, but that one person still deserves equal access and they could be the change in STEM. Who knows, they might have the cure for cancer. You're saying that by putting barriers up, they don't have, they don't deserve to be here. So I think it's definitely something that needs to change. <laughs> 
So uh, for me, uh, so I, I guess, you know, it has more to do with the current state of things for me than it did for uh, grad school and so forth in terms of, you know, what people ask me frequently. And it actually kind of leads to, I think another type of question is like, that I think because I do a lot of talks, I go to a lot of conferences, especially with COVID being virtual. And a lot of things that come around frequently is what do these, what do these conferences do to help me uh, participate, right? And um, usually the only type of accommodations I really ask for is closed captioning. Was you know we have auto AI and Zoom closed caption. I'm very thankful to uh, the committee here for putting this in, right? So one of the things we you know we we have to think about you know when COVID nineteen pandemic first hit, right? And people were learning how to pivot to online, including conferences and so forth, meeting. It's it was understandable that people may not have thought about. Uh, how to be able to put the closed captions in, right? People still had to learn about it. But, you know, here we are like a year and a half later and you go to a virtual conference and there's no closed caption. Or if you act for it, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, but we didn't really have time to figure out how to implement this. Um, and then I was make you know, some kind of, Dr. Kluza, we can't hear you. You have you are muted. Uh, you. I'm sorry. That's oh, okay. Well. okay. Let me start this again. <laughs> All right. So um, let me just do it faster. All right. So uh, in in case of composite, um, when we had before when we first started COVID nineteen. And we, you know, people were still trying to figure out how to make things work online and conferences. We understood that. But a year and a half later, um, again, we just could not um, be able to automatically get the closed caption in these conferences. We still have several of these, like it costs money. Yes, um, so did the registration fee, right? So what, what is the registration fee paying for it, right? Um, I'm okay with paying a few dollars more if it makes sure that we get the minimum accessibility things we need. And, you know, like I said, you know, you know, I was actually just one conference and they could have figured out how to implement it right before. And I asked them to put on the uh, OASU subtitles in the PowerPoint. And uh, it, it was kind of a kind of deflating experience because uh, to, to a graduate student credit. If a graduate student or even undergrad was presenting, they turn it on. But the professors who did it, only about 25% of them turned them on. The others who didn't have it turned on, the moderator didn't say anything to them. And this moderator was the same one that led the diversity session later on. So, you know, after I gave my talk, I decided to check out of that conference, right? So, you know, those kinds of things when, you know, it doesn't have to be a fully active um, you know, dismissal of you. It's just simply uh, really pay attention to this part that's important for you because, you know, it, it wasn't our priority, right? Like Alyssa says, um, if I'm the only one here and they say, why should we do this for you? Well, that tells you so much about what science is, right? If you don't, don't have this belief that every person has intrinsic value and be able to contribute to science. That says so much more about the people in science that any words can't, right? So th this is something that, you know, has to change. It, it really does. Um, every person has the ability to make great strides in science. They just need the tools to do so. Right, and I like to just you know conclude by using an example of Stephen Hawking. Right, Stephen Hawking and his contribution uh, to theoretical physics, to black hole radiation, 
he was already well underway in his academic career when his condition became progressive. But imagine if his condition happened earlier in his life where he was already in a wheelchair before he started, what he had been given the chance to do the things that he did there. I don't think so. And that, that really needs to change. Thank you so much. Um, okay, now uh, we, we'll move on to the section where we would like to discuss uh, resources for people with disabilities in academia or working in labs. And the first question that we have is, for all the panelists is, what has been the most and the least useful resource available to, or, or what, what are some of the most and least useful resources available to people with disabilities working in academia and research labs? I, I could go ahead and just throw a little bit. Um, so I will say um, the most useful resource for me um, has actually been disability Twitter. Um, that is something I'm always going to recommend to any disabled person. If you feel alone, you are not alone. Get a Twitter account, start connecting with disability Twitter, follow those hashtags and you'll you will see how many other disabled people are out there. It's a great tool for visibility and representation, right? And you can make connections with other disabled scientists. So that's the most useful resource and it's free, right? Hopefully for, for future years to come. And I would say the least, um, the least useful resource, again, would have to be like the Disability Resource Center and I'm not trying to dog on the people there because it can be complicated. A lot of times they're underfunded, they're understaffed, and there are limitations on what they can do, right? Uh, it, it, it's kind of more like a toxic environment than anything else. And so, um, and you know, I imagine that, you know, even the good people that really fight hard for disabled students have to go through so much red tape and uphill battle. Because again, like Alyssa said, when you're a very small percentage of a population, they, they don't give you the same level of care, right? So, and I say that the least useful resource with the stipulation that I would love to see something make it into a more equitable and useful resource in the future. That's what I'm always hoping for. I'm gonna bounce off of that and of course recommend Twitter. So I started my disabled and STEM Twitter account when I had gotten into grad school and the pandemic first hit because I was looking for others that were like me and how to navigate grad school. And I saw the hashtag, but there wasn't much activity for it. And I was like, I know there's other people out there. So my inspiration kind of starting the hashtag was in order to create more conversations and bring awareness to the issues and be like, I'm not alone. What resources do exist? because there is a lack of resources in general. For me, like personally saying like the best or like least helpful resource is really hard in general because I have a rare disability. So it's not anything standardized. So I haven't been able to really get help and there's not like a certain resource to turn to. So it's a lot of figuring it out on my own and trying to navigate that. So I was able to do that through Twitter and see what other people resources that they have used. Another thing I would, say is a good resource, but is not necessarily for disabled people are some of the programs I mentioned. So the REU offered by University of Delaware for people with disabilities, because that got me into research, the PrEP program, and like having these programs exist, even if they're not necessarily for people with disabilities, but kind of just hoping to start the conversation that disabilities are represented in STEM and deserve the actual access. So these programs should also help the disabled get get in. I would definitely say the least helpful resource has been disability services. I've been, I'm a second year at Baylor right now and I'm still fighting for just notes in my classes. So far I finished all of my elective credits and have not gotten notes at all for any of my classes. And that's been a huge challenge. Despite having doctor's notes, despite doing this, despite jumping through all the hoops, it comes down to a lot of institutions being like, oh, we don't have the resources to do that. We don't actually have anything for that. 
And another thing that would be helpful, it's under the least resources, but it should be under the most one day is funding specifically for people with disabilities, because people with disabilities tend to have higher medical bills, which is a burden in itself. So living off of a stipend for many of these positions are hard. So it kind of circles back to some programs have it for underrepresented minorities, which disability does apply but is often not the focus of. So I was lucky and got the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And that empowered me to find a lab because I think that if I was just another disabled student without my own funding, I don't think I would have had many lab opportunities. So I think really having more funding would be extremely beneficial to making and retaining people with disabilities in STEM. Thanks. So I, I think about this a little bit differently, and, and what I might propose is uh, somewhat a nuclear option. So when it, it comes to um, funding, it can be amazing what doesn't get funded until there really is a major emergency. So uh, certain college, I won't name colleges, I'll just say that uh, there have been certain colleges that have student populations of around 20,000 students who have had Office of Civil Rights complaints against them and have come up with $150 million um, in order to put towards becoming what are now seen as models of uh, accessible institutions. Um, personally, in my position, my goal, we have not had one of these to such a major extent my goal is to put everything in place so we don't um, and to think about it from the standpoint of, of, you know, how can we help the most people with accessibility and then also help, uh, at our case, it's our Office of Disability Services is called DRES um, at Champaign. How can we then help them do that other, you know, uh, get to 100% there too? Um, but the fear... Let, let me just say that there are uh, administrators at each of your institutions who live in mortal fear of that word of an OCR, and it is a nuclear option. Um, I don't, in my experience, I don't see any fallout for students or faculty when it comes to that, but I do see an amazing amount of immediate funding which appears that is being used, or I'll just say being used on other things. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and, and before I move to the next question, just a note, uh, just I would just like to remind all the panelists that if and when you are not speaking, please feel free to answer questions in the chat. Uh, we are getting some really interesting questions in the chat, so so please feel free to just reply to those questions in the chat. Um, okay, so the next question we have is, what should new graduate students or postdocs or, or uh, PIs with disabilities look for in an institute or a lab or a department in terms of resources and, or accommodations while applying for, for, for either a graduate uh, program or jobs? Uh, and and so the specific question is, can or should students and postdocs ask the department and the program MPI if they have ever worked with people with disabilities before? So uh, uh, I'll take this one, just my view as always, um, the power dynamics is off here. The person acting the program and the PI stands to lose a lot more than they do. Um, I would not, you know, again, I'm not here to say what you can and can't do. I'm just worried that if you let the department and the PI know that you're disabled before you even apply, I'm worried that that's gonna hurt your chances to be accepted. But I also understand the, the flip side is that if you do not, disclose a disability, um, which is medically protected, right? There's not information you have to give them, right? The other fear is that if you do get into the program, you do get into the situation and 
um, you're having issues with your disability limiting your productivity, and then your PI department finds out that you're going to be retaliated again. And um, I will say right now, um, you know, connecting to Twitter, disability Twitter, we talk about disability history. History is continuing today. We have examples of disabled students that are being forced out of their programs right now, right? So because they're not getting accommodations or they, their superiors found out that they had disability and then all of a sudden the ableism went off the chart, you know, really heavy prejudice forcing them out and so forth. So I, I would say here, um, when, you, when you are scouting out a possible place to go to, and you're looking for some place that can be uh, uh, accommodating and friendly for your disability. Uh, fortunately, I, I have to say that we, you know, you have to do, you have to do a lot of work vetting the place. Uh, at the minimum, talk to people who have uh, graduated from the department, from these labs, talk to them. Uh, do a search on disability Twitter for your university, see if you can find any connection with disabled students. Get their information. I would also say um, definitely try to, you know, do some Google searches on the place that you want to go to. See how they handle other cases of other underrepresented groups, right? So, for example, um, how many uh, black professors do they have in the department? Uh, what about sexual harassment? I mean, has there been a big case of sexual harassment? Has it been ongoing? Is it someone who's finally found guilty of sexual harassment only after they were there for 20 years? How they treat other underrepresented groups is likely how they're going to treat you, and probably even worse, because uh, for some of for some of these places. Uh, being disabled makes you appear weaker to the predators that can be in academia and so forth, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not too much of a fan of asking the question directly head on to the places you want to go for those reasons. But again, you know, it, it, it's tough. There's no um, easy, like risk-free answer, I think. But I think the things I did talk about should help mitigate some of that risk. I think this was a question that I wish I had answers to before picking a PhD program because it was something I really struggled with. I remember asking my mentors at the time, do I disclose all my applications? And my mentors were not people with disabilities so they were like, it could go either way, which is, I mean, true. It could be there be a benefit. So they could say, oh, they want somebody with a disability. They're aware of my identity and I don't need to mask myself. Or it could be, we don't want somebody with a disability because it could be costly to accommodate them and all other issues with that. So I really struggled with it. I did end up disclosing in my applications. And what I looked for when it came down to all the acceptances I got was kind of which institutions even had a disability website or mention, which is not necessarily a great basis, but it was like, at least they pretend to have something and it seems like they're having these conversations. So that was one way that I did it. I would recommend now when people ask me, I say, look for institutions that have diversity groups. So you could reach out to these diversity groups and say, is there a disability group on campus? If not, can you recommend a fellow student that may be open about their disability and willing to share their experiences. So now my institution says that we have a disability club on campus. So now I have incoming students or prospective students reach out to me and kind of want to learn more about it rather than just seeing the institutional website and being willing to initiate those conversations. So doing things like that and trying to find the back way end because I think administration and are always going to say, yes, you will be accommodated because it's the law and your ADA, but there's a lot more nuance to it that you could find out by individuals who are open about their disabilities, which may not even exist at the institution though in general. So it's definitely a hard situation to navigate. And I'd just like to add something quickly on that. I, I um, <clears throat> when I saw this question, I thought, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, because 
you might not get in if you disclose, which shouldn't be, but in practicality. Um, but thinking about students and their own fit and how comfortable they're going to be, I think is very important. Uh, I can say that when I was at UIS, we had a we redid the whole CS program, which was online. And we had a student who was visually impaired who got his bachelor's degree online in CS. And then he advocated and got more students to come to UIS that way. So it was a good fit. So I do agree with you know that. And I don't, this is just a question or a thought based on what Steven said about, you know, how the institution may treat different types of diversity. I see a lot that diversity is binary only and there's no intersectionality to it. And so some institutions are really good on uh, religious diversity or racial diversity or gender diversity. So if the only issue or concern is disability uh, inclusion and a school, you know, hits that mark, then that would, I would say, you know, do that. But they may be putting all their focus on one of those others because we, we as humans only like to think in binary um, and never the intersectionality, so. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are already approaching the hour mark and uh, I think we can quickly take one last question, which is um, again, how can people with disabilities approach or demand demand resources from institutional offices? And are there any specific resources available from government and private foundations? I think there's power in numbers. So I think trying to organize and see if there are other individuals that experience discrimination or ableism in your campus and finding those individuals to talk with and share experiences, not only reaffirm, reaffirms that you're not alone and you're not the problem, it really helps to show that this is an institution-wide problem. And here we have these demands and how can we make it better? So there's really power in numbers and finding others, which is often hard to do because you're not gonna be sending an email out and say, hey, who else is disabled? It really comes from all of the networking. Hey, do you know anybody who has a disability, whether they're invisible, visible? So a lot of that is part of it is trying to weed out those networks and find the connections because they're not always obvious. Uh, would the other panelists like to add uh, onto this? Sorry, I just kind of catching up after replying to the chat. Um, so I, I just like to just um, get behind what Willis is saying, you know, there's power in number. And also, um, if, if you think about the, the demographic where we say between 19 and 33 percent of people have disability is still a minority, right? Um, and if it's only going to be the responsibility of the minority to change things for the majority, uh, we're never going to get anywhere. Um, what we really need, um, you know, with people who do not have any disability, um, we really need genuine allies there. We need them to um, be in solidarity with them. Um, and of course, uh, one of the things I also want to want to mention, um, I think that this, thing, this saying is more popular now, um, there's no diversity without disability, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about di diversity initiatives, um, more often than not, they don't include disability um, talks in it, right? And it's really a shame because whether you're looking at underrepresentation of, you know, minorities, for example, right, and you don't include uh, disability in it, then how can you really advocate for all of that minority if you don't advocate for those minorities with the disability, right? So um, every, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, at the key, like intersectional, right, and. Uh, like I'll point out, I'm actually probably the, one of the exceptions of the case, right? Where I only really have one identity, right? I'm disabled, but I'm a white male, right? But what about 
people who are, you know, black, disabled, and recognized as female. There's three identities that compound them, right? They're going to go through so much more than I do, right? So, um, you know, if we truly believe that everyone should be in science, then um, those, you know, like myself, that is one of the reasons why I do that because I'm in a relatively good position compared to other people, right? But we also need non-disabled people to help normalize the accommodations we're asking for. And let me just give you a quick example. Um, I mentioned with the PowerPoint, always use subtitles. Uh, when I just started using it, you'd be surprised, I was surprised that you know, a few of my students who do not have disability thank me for allowing those closed captions because there was such visual learners that they realized that they really understood a lecture more when I had to subtitle because they could read along. But also, um, now this tends to be more US centric, but it costs money to get a diagnosis. And when you have diagnosis, you need a diagnosis to get accommodation. So I actually had students who um, had disabilities, uh, had trouble understanding professors to talk too fast. I always made sure that I talk at a reasonable pace and I had a closed caption on. And they like, thank you so much, right? So those are the things that, you know, um, you know, especially when you teach virtually, um, you know, assuming you don't make them turn on the camera, pretty much all, dis all disabilities are invisible to you, right? So you need to uh, go ahead and just put, do these small things. These small things can have a huge impact, right? But, you know, what I do say, like, you know, for the student, you know, um, non-disabled students, non-disabled grad students, postdoc, um, stand in solidarity with your dis disabled people, disabled peeps, right? And just, you know, said, oh, you know, they're asking for this, I need this too, right? Because, you know, this helps me. So the more people that ask for those accommodations, the harder it is for uh, that professor or that organization to say no, right? So that, you know, that, that's in my opinion, you know, that we need genuine ally. And sometimes it's not always clear how to be a genuine ally too, right? But um, there's one of the other things that I try to really think about, um, uh, you know, you know, finding a lack of resources for faculty to understand what happens with each disability, what the etiquette for disability. Um, not everyone knows that for someone in wheelchairs, you should never just grab their handlebars to help them, right? Because it's an extension of the body. Those kinds of things, right? Uh, training, I think training is desperately needed for faculty to go through and be able to understand um, just these small changes that they can do that can have a huge impact. So I'd like to say two things. <clears throat> One, legally, since January 2018, if something is digital, it has to be accessible regardless. That is the law. That is the federal law. So, I mean, from the standpoint of, you know, one person and, you know, it's just that one person, that's not what the law says. Um, and there have been, there is a growing number of studies that say, as, as Steve has pointed out, other students use the exact same thing, just like universal design of ramps has helped, you know, when I had, you know, younger children and pushed them up baby carriages and stuff like that is one thing. Uh, but as, as far as a resource, I entirely agree with the network of, of people that, you know, are students who have disabilities and people, you know, uh, but also really the, the powerhouse at any university is your faculty. And if the numbers don't lie, coming in at a third of the population, and I have, I admit that I have done this, your faculty, they have someone in their family with a disability. And there's a cognitive dissonance that they uh, have that they don't think about, oh, well, you know, I forgot that my daughter is visually impaired. I mean, it, I am not kidding. It, 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 is, it is one of those things I'm like, oh, I guess I want that I go to these same things at my kid's school and do this, but I hadn't ever thought about it for, you know, the students I've taught for 20 years. Um, so it doesn't take too much effort to figure out who this faculty are. Some of them will still be resistant uh, even when you make that connection for them. 
which is just blows my mind. But um, for those that do make the connection, it'll be priceless because they're sitting on the faculty senate. And they're the ones, you know, who have a lot of, you know, chips that they've been piling up over the years. Yeah, and I, and I do want to kind of point out something here um, that, you know, in my view, uh, when we deal about um, changing the attitudes of the faculty and so forth, sorry, that's my cat. Uh, we don't have to change every single one of their minds at the same time. All we need to do is get the majority. Right, get over 50% of that faculty, you know, being thinking about accessibility. And once the ones who are resistant are in a minority, they can be persuaded to come around. Um, right. So, you know, you just need to get that critical mass. And that's really what this is about. How can we get that critical mass to affect this change at a systemic level? All right, thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, we have come to the end of today's workshop and unfortunately we had a lot more to discuss, but, but the discussion was so great that we were barely able to scratch the surface. Thank you all for being with us today. And thank you again to all the panelists for taking out their uh, time and share their experiences and provide their insights. I thought personally for me, this was very insightful, revealing and thought-provoking and, and, and I feel and I hope that the, the other participants felt the same and, and that this will help us become much better allies. Um, so if anyone uh, is here who's not a part of the GSA, uh, stay tuned for our next uh, for the upcoming workshop Wednesday series in November, January, March and May. Uh, and the Career Development Subcommittee will be putting together re a resource package based on today's discussion. Uh, and please follow uh, GSA and the Career Development Committee on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And also please go and follow Alyssa and Stephen on Twitter and connect with Dr. Vance on LinkedIn. Uh, and check your uh, emails to get the updates as soon as we distribute them. Uh, thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of this. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, this is so much fun. Uh, but yeah, anyone who's reached out, um, just let me know. We can talk more. Uh, continue the conversation.